Hello, everyone. Welcome to our weekly webinar. Um, I'm here with uh, Dr. Klingat. We, we, he will join us soon. I just wanted to say a couple of things before we start. Firstly, thank you so much for the birthday wishes that we received. So many from you and so kind, so many kind words, um, which um, really gave us a smile. So thank you, thank you, thank you. That's really nice from me and Dietrich. Um, really a lot of gratitude for that. Thank you. Um, now, before we start, I just wanted to say for those of you that are looking for an email address to send questions to, actually, we have decided that the Klinger Institute was so overwhelmed with questions that now the questions, we collect, we collect them when you put them in the Q&A. Once uh, Dr. Klinger starts uh, with the webinar, then um, I, I will stop the chat so that people can actually concentrate on uh, learning or, you know, listening to what Dr. Klingard is, is talking about. And then uh, if you put them in the Q&A, we will collect those and then we try to answer. So from last week, from the Lime webinar from last week, we have collected a lot of questions which we are aiming to answer tonight. And um, that's what we're gonna do. So now thank you again for the birthday wishes. It was our birthdays. <laughs> um, Dietrich and I are here um, in uh, the Swiss Mountain Clinic and uh, uh, Dietrich is receiving an award. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want me to mention it, but uh, um, I will mention it because I'm very proud. <laughs> he is receiving an award for his medicine and his honesty and courage. So I'm very proud of that. And I want to share that with all of you. And uh, so, yes, we are really uh, ready to start. It's um, 8.30 here. So we are now 9.30, different times, wherever you are. So I'm going to disable the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so, yes, Dietrich, if you're ready, here's the chair for you. <laughs> So, hi everybody. Um, my, my talks are meant, you know, for both healthcare practitioners and for patients. And then for my more personal friends all the way from Auckland to Stuttgart and the other way around the planet. And um, most of you are aware that I changed a little bit of what I talk about. Um, Many of you are aware, some are not, that the freedom of speech is completely gone in terms of the social media, and um, it is highly restricted <laughs> what I can talk about. And so tonight, I want to restrain myself, give myself a restraining order and just talk about Lyme, just about the questions that come in, and I use these special uh, blue light reflecting glasses that a friend has bought for me. And um, here we go. So um, I don't think I should mention the name of the person, so I won't. Can the foot bath aluminum protocol be done at the same time as the 21 day parasite protocol? And then also with the Lyme protocol. Thank you. So first of all, the, <laughs> the foot bath cannot only be done with the aluminum um, a detox protocol or with the parasite protocol, but these protocols belong together. When you kill parasites which, or eliminate parasites uh, and some of them die, they release back the toxins that have stored. In my parasite talk, I showed you that some parasites are able to um, uh, extract from the host the aluminum and the glyphosate and other toxins and concentrate them 300, 400 times in their own body. And so when you kill these beasts with the parasite program, they're releasing that back in the system. And so it makes huge amount of sense to use the foot bath, which really reduces the toxin burden on all of the toxins that are on our body, all the 20,000 plus ones, and then combining it, you know, meaningful doses of chlorella and zeolite um, or other binders, it could just be fiber. Um, it's, it's a winning formula and that of course applies as well to Lyme disease. You know, we, I showed you evidence that aluminum is a growth factor for Lyme spirochetes. And so means 
that the lime contaminated areas are heavily loaded with aluminum in general. And so when you kill lime, some of the aluminum is released back in the system. So having an aluminum detox protocol on board is a really good idea. After treatment for Lyme and Babesia with chronic constipation, will peristalsis return? So let's talk about the peristaltic movement. Yeah, so there is uh, the third part of the autonomic nervous system, which is often forgotten. It's called the enteric nervous system. And the enteric nervous system is loosely connected with the brainstem through the vagus nerve. And so when you do not have peristaltic movement, it's usually neurological damage. It could be to the vagus nerve. It's one of the 12 cranial nerves that gets highly affected by Borrelia. But we know, for example, that the, the unfortunately, the vagus nerve has come travels down here, uh, can be the, <laughs> the tunnel system, the tube through which bugs that are generally in your brain or brain stem like Babesia and Bartonella travel down into the enteric nervous system of the gut and really, really um, diminish your peristaltic movement and the, the healthy movement of the gut, which is the, the main neurotransmitter and that is serotonin, which is created to a large degree by the bugs in your bowel. And so when the bowel is not moving, uh, on the surface, it's a lack of serotonin and there's drugs like uh, Motegrity and, and other medical drugs that can give the gut selectively funnel uh, serotonin to the area so you get more of a neurological movement uh, of the gut but you can also do that by trying to restore the bowel flora and this is to my special friend um, in the community the the best way to restore the bowel flora is not to give probiotics it's to give prebiotics and the best prebiotic is fiber and especially for the person who asked this question um, the one way of getting enough, it's very difficult to get enough fiber into the system, the current nutrition, even if you eat well. And so uh, one of the prescriptions I give to patients that is working beautifully is that I recommend to make an eight ounce glass of juice in the morning of vegetable juice. It should not be too sweet. It shouldn't just be beets and carrots. So it should be some, <laughs> some bitter things in there. And, um, you know, cabbage is great, broccoli is great. Spinach may have too much oxalate in it and may be restricted. But anyway, you make the juice and then you give the juice part actually to your children or to your neighbors and you eat the fiber that comes out on the other end of the machine and all of it. You know, you put it in a Tupperware container or some other reasonably non-toxic container and you eat it throughout the day that is usually within three or four days, gets the hardest non-moving gut moving. But if you do that for several months, you regrow your own natural flora, which is different from the flora of your boyfriend or your husband or your children. It's going to be unique to you. And so whenever you give probiotics, you just select out of the 2,500 species of bugs you should have, you select one or two that you overemphasize, which usually never ends well. So anyway, these are just a few inherent uh, tips. Most constipation in Lyme is a neurological disease. It's not a disease of the um, gut itself. And it's not, uh, constipation is too superficial a diagnosis. It's a neurological form of non-movement. Uh, the medical drugs work like motegrity. There is, um, I forgot the name, it's an herbal, a company in Germany has been bought up by Bayer, <laughs> same company that now owns Monsanto. There's an herbal product that does do some of that. In my office in Seattle and in Switzerland, we use neural therapy to get things back going. The injection of the vagus nerve, the injection to the cilia plexus, segmental therapy to the gut from the front and the back, and that generally uh, works. Very often, somebody like who asks this question, who doesn't have any bowel movements, has a dental interference field, a root canal um, a, a extraction site that spills uh, rantes and other toxins into the system. Yeah, so here's a bit of a hodgepodge of ideas. Okay, now the next question. Do you know where to go to find a lab which can check the tick itself? 
Yeah. So in the US, we use IGNX. You send the tick there, and you have to kind of specify what you're looking for. Usually it's Bartonella, Borrelia, and Babesia. Those are the three big ones. Um, and in uh, Europe, in Germany, it's Armin Labs. And if you live, live in England, just go, you know, because England is no longer part of the EU to get something sent to Germany from England is a nightmare. And to send it to America, there's lots of uh, restrictions now because of COVID and all that. So Nancy is asking regarding Lyme disease tests, Army labs won't accept blood samples from the US. Please recommend the best Lyme disease lab if Army labs in Germany cannot test American samples. Okay, I answered that. Yeah, so it's IGNX. There's other labs now that are competing with IGNX, but IGNX has sort of worked themselves up a reputation. They published a few papers and uh, most courts in the US, uh, when it comes to that, accept um, the findings that are presented by IGNX. Um, also, immunoblood test from IGNX is new and is not a Western blood test. Joe Boroscano recommends it. Is it accurate? Yes, the immunoblood is a um, PCR based test um, that is very accurate if it's positive but it has a lot of false negatives. So it's not as sensitive as the LTT ELI spot that Army Labs does. And so there is some restrictions. What is the name of the company that cultures samples for three months? Thank you. I actually don't know. I know that the same Joe Boroscano who recommends now the immunoblood um, has been involved in the research to try to get the Lyme culture going, which for all other infections in the human conditions, the culture is the ultimate proof that you have the injection, the infection or not. But um, Joe helped to organize the, the research and the funding and to actually getting us a Lyme culture test, which is excellent. It is 100% sensitive and positive, but the FDA so far is refusing um, to accept it uh, as a standing accord over the medical boards. So that's the latest I've seen. And so you're not using it for that reason because I use ART testing, my form of muscle reflex testing, which has given us the more accurate and, and quicker results. And, and we can use it to immediately follow therapy uh, to see if you know, if you're getting somewhere with a patient. When you do it with a lab, it always takes four weeks before you get an answer. So if I put somebody on the medicine today, I want to know tomorrow if it works. I don't want to know in four or five weeks. But anyway, so we use IGNX in America, Army Labs in Europe. And um, so in England, you, Army Labs has a relationship with Germany from England. So it's possible. It's just a little bit more difficult. OK. What do you use to get the lime to come out and play so we can use the ozone? Well, um, to the, the trouble, you know, obviously with Lyme disease is that uh, in the chronic form, when it, it takes on more the form of an autoimmune disease, you know, against your adrenals or against your liver cells or other parts of the brain, many people, and it takes on the form of autoimmune disease, Lyme has withdrawn into the cystic form um, into or into biofilm or both, you know, so it, it can withdraw inside your own body cells and have a semi-dormant state there, or it can be outside the cells in biofilm, lining the sheaths of all nerves, lining the sheaths of the, the gut, lining the sheaths, the inner lining of the blood vessels, um, the, the capillaries in the liver, you know, the, the bile duct is 2,000 miles of that, it can line that. Biofilm containing Lyme, um, Cystic, the cystic form of Lyme disease the, uh, that is so, so dreaded. And how do you get that cystic form? Well, you get it when you treat Lyme with antibiotics. You're forcing it into that form. It's a survival mechanism. And in that form, it's biologically relatively inactive. That means it doesn't secrete a significant amount of biotoxins or cytokines or any of that. The trouble with that is that the immune system doesn't like it. It senses the, the foreign DNA uh, and the unwanted pathogen information 
in the biofilm, but it can't see it. And so our immune system attacks in every tissue in the body that either has the same surface markers or any tissue that harbors these cysts. And so the autoimmune part of line that comes 15, 20, 30 years later is a response to that. And so the question is then how do we treat it? So it's, you know, my suggestion is we have to bring the inappropriate immune system responses down. And I, I think I'd like to say that right here because there's other questions coming up. The old German treatment of autohemotherapy works. It is once or twice a week, you draw, you start with three cc's, you draw three cc's of blood from the patient's arm. You can mix it with homeopathics, but you can use it straight and you inject it on the opposite body side in the bum, in the muscle, it has to be intramuscular. So whatever information is in the blood, you give a small dose into the muscle. There's a different type of immune system that gets woken up and you can in, increase this dose to 10 cc's. There's uh, several hundred peer-reviewed studies on this, none of them from the last, last 30 years, but from before then. So that's done about 10 times after about the third or fourth shot, you get a big immune reaction and then it down-regulates the inappropriate reactions. You can also do that with urine. Uh, the simple form of urine therapy is to drink a six ounce glass of your own urine different times of the day, once a day but then you can sort of indulge in it and sometimes do a weekend where you recirculate all of it. You know? We've modified that and use a homeopathic version of that. That's not part of this talk here, but that's my treatment for mast cell activation syndrome, all the hype that's out there right now with all the things you could do. Yes, you can turn off that part of the immune system, the, the so-called M1 activation with luteolin and, um, and other bioflavonoids. The trouble with that is you bring the M1 state down and force it into the M2 stage, which I'm not gonna get into, but you increase your risk of cancer. So you got the choice of either being the inflamed patient or the cancer patient. Yeah, it's not my idea, you know, that's how God made it. Um, so we use hyaluronic acid to seduce the bugs that are in the different morphological form in the cystic form or have shed everything else but just pure DNA living in the biofilm with very little body around it. When it senses the hyaluronic acid coming by, these forms change immediately within a second to the morphological proper form of Lyme disease, the spirochete, in which form it can move. In, in the cystic form, it cannot move. It doesn't have legs, yeah, but the cystic form moves like a cork screw through the tissues. And so the moment these things in the biofilm or inside the cell sense the hyaluronic acid drifting by, they come out. And when they're out, they're vulnerable to whatever you have on board. And so we, we, we use the um, hyaluronic acid as a bait and there's different forms of hyaluronic acid. I can say that here is the one that you can get in America from BioPure. In England, in Europe, you get it from Key Science. And that's a proper small molecular size that gets absorbed sublingually as you go under the tongue and within minutes it's in the bloodstream and it's when the bugs start coming out and so usually we do that first and then we chase it um, about half an hour later or so with uh, the kivita or one of the other lime cocktails um, good let me see here yeah here's an important question could cushing's be a result of Lyme disease? There were other questions. Also, could Addison's be the result of Lyme disease? The answer is absolute yes. And it's this very mechanism I just described. You know, Cushing's is when you over time produce too much cortisol 24 seven, and Cushing's usually precedes the crash, you know, when the adrenals burn out, and then you have Addison's disease, you know, where you uh, get the severe adrenal fatigue. And so, Again, like to, to fix that situation, the, the overall global most elegant way of treating uh, to downregulate the immune system responses is autohemotherapy, autourine therapy, and then the sugar galactose. But you need quite a bit, it's a teaspoon, maybe six times a day. Um, that, you know, it's a fantastic treatment. There's a whole um, science of using biological sugars for, for treatment. 
Yeah, so that's one part. But then the other part is, of course, with the adrenals, how do you restore the adrenals? Yeah, we know that phosphatidyl serine down regulates the cortisol production uh, if you are in a cushing state. Yeah, so we use phosphatidyl serine for that. It's also good for the memory. But the, the more serious side really is Addison's when the adrenals are failing to produce cortisol. You know, without cortisol, you die. And so the FDA, at least in the US, has taken away all of our organ therapies that were meaningful and simple. You know, we could take the adrenal of an animal, of a sheep or a goat, and um, you know, as a byproduct of the normal meat production, could take those adrenals, put them in a blender, put it through a to a filter, and inject the adrenal into people. And that cured Addison's disease overnight. Yeah, But we do not have that available. There is now offshoots and all products and um, things that are available. Um, I just learned uh, from a friend that uh, the, the top hormone docs treat Addison's disease with a mix of fludrocortisone, yeah, that's a patent a compound, fludrocortisone, it comes in, uh, I think the 0 0.1 milligram tablets and you take it in half, we take a half a tablet every other day. And then um, I like uh, the work with low dose cortisol, it's called the physiological dosing of cortisol, which is sort of for most people 10 milligrams twice a day. Um, that's for the adrenal crash that, that later, form of it yeah but the foundational therapy has to be to get the line bugs out of there we don't know of any other bug that embeds themselves into adrenal tissue or liver tissue or some of the relevant tissues other than borrelia yeah all the other things are over time thrown out the viruses the coxsackie viruses and the um the retroviruses you know they they tend to not harbor in these tissues for long, but Lyme does for a life lifetime and needs to come out. You know? And so it's my Lyme treatment with the cocktails, with the Japanese knotweed, the Kivita, uh, given with cautious dosing, you start with very, very low dosing and build it up. It's both immune modulating and killing. And on, on the other end, you use those therapies to shoot it down, regulate the hyperactive arm of the immune system you know, with those tricks that I share with you. Um, I, unfortunately, I, I would have to say this, you know, that the, the, every year there's a new kid on the block here in medicine that everybody runs after, you know, it was for many years Richie Shoemaker's mold thing, and then it was Lyme before that, and it was Epstein-Barr, and then in the 80s it was Candida. Right now it's mast cell activation syndrome, everybody's got it, and, you know, the main cause of it is the exposure to Wi-Fi, and none of the lectures I've heard about it are acknowledging that even though it's the obvious elephant in the living room. And so the proper treatment for mast cell activation syndrome is to get out of the Wi-Fi environment. You know, that takes political action, social action, cultural action, uh, community action. It takes us to take up the warrior sword and become warriors. So there's no other real solution for that. And so short of that, um, I give you the tricks, the old German tricks, autohemotherapy, autohemotherapy, um, the really forms of low-dose immunotherapy that work and they're simple, anybody can do it. Okay, so next question here, to what extent does low-dose antigen therapy provide symptomatic relief from these infections? So first of all, there is low-dose antigen therapy, which is mostly uh, Butch Schrader's uh, import from, from England here, um, that is the largely, uh, the power of that is the chemicals and the food, and it's typically given in a C6, uh, the sort of standard solution that's given to the patient. Sometimes you have to do higher dilutions of that. That's not totally different, but it's different from Ty Vincent's adaptation of the LDI, low-dose immunotherapy, where we use, instead of doing a standard dose of a C6, we have um, a test kit from a C5 to a C30 for mold, for chlamydia, for the herpes viruses, for Borrelia, for yeast, and so on. The latest adaptation that Thai has de developed is a mix of many different species of Lyme and co-infections together with many species of mold 
together with many species of parasites, the homeopathic dilutions of that is called LYP. And that is fantastic and down-regulating uh, in many patients' uh, immune reactions. We haven't seen consistent miracles with that, even though I believe I'm doing it right. I know Ty would disagree with that. Um, he thinks the ART is bullshit because he's never worked with an ART practitioner. There's lots of practitioners in the US that say they do ART, but um, none of them claim that, you know, very few of them I've known personally, and so I don't know whether I learned it, but we have a very specific way with ART to actually determine what infection is relevant. And then within that, to look for the proper uh, dilution of the immunotherapy for it. And with that, we get consistent results, but not miracles. So we're combining the low-dose immunotherapy with meaningful antimicrobial therapies and reasonable detox therapies, and that does very well. Um, so, Wendy is asking, there was an emphasis on biotin in previous seminar. Does that help with Lyme and does it need to be taken alone or with all the B vitamins like B1 you just mentioned? So, very briefly, so I mentioned biotin very specifically is one of the two absolutely known missing ingredients in the brain of autistic children. It wasn't meant to be a talk about Lyme disease. It was uh, very, very targeted for autistic children or autistic people, you know, that they're all deficient in biotin and we expect improvements when we give them 20 or 30,000 units of biotin every day. Now, the I'm a strong opponent for B vitamin complex therapy. My mom forced it on us when I was a kid and I'm probably traumatized from that. But uh, we, in ART testing, it shows very often that the, um, you know, the, the B complexes have that strong pungent smell. It's a form of vitamin B1 that's completely non-absorbable. That, you know, so the companies that make B vitamin complexes use the cheapest ingredients, trying to sell them for the highest price, it's business. And so we like uh, to determine which one of the B vitamins you actually need. Is it B1? Is it B2? Is it B3, niacin? Is it B5, pantothenic acid? Uh, is it B6? And then there's two forms of B6. Is it, you know, folic acid? I think it's listed as B9. And which form of it is folate? That is methylated folate and <laughs> folic acid. Uh, is it hydroxycobalamin, the B12 or, or methylcobalamin um, or adenosylcobalamin? Yeah, so we, we test each one of the, the B vitamins are important, don't get me wrong, but they should not be given in the endless combination of the same, but we, we should figure out which one is it actually that's needed. You know, if you have trouble with your eyes, it's probably B2. You know, and if you have uh, neurological pain, it's probably B1, but then you probably need benfotiamine, which is the more absorbable form of it and not thiamine, or you need to even inject it because you can't absorb it. So it's worthwhile, at least for our ART practitioners, to spend time of figuring out which B vitamin you need. And yes, in chronic Lyme disease, they are very important, but please don't give a B complex. At least spread them out over the day. You know, give B1 in the morning and B2 an hour later and B3 or niacin at lunchtime and so on and so forth. Yeah, so that's all I can say to the question. Um, you can verify the statement I just made that most people are not compatible with the B complex. Uh, you use a Coca pulse test. Arthur Coca, Coca was a genius in medicine. So he discovered when you eat something that you're allergic to, your pulse rate goes up because it's sympathetic nervous system stress. And so, yes, the simple test is you take somebody's pulse, <laughs> you give them the B vitamin complex, open the capsule, put it on the tongue so you get an immediate effect wait five minutes and test the pulse again. If it goes up four pulse rates, four, four beats per minute or more, patient is allergic. And the more it goes up, the more allergic you are. You can do that with all supplements, um, but you need to start with the resting pulse rate. You can't start after you've just been jogging and your heart rate is 120. It needs to be at the low rate that you have been in a healthy state. Okay. When clients present with parasites, Lyme, fungus, an active retrovirus, what is the best to address first? I know parasites are usually the first thing to address, 
but do you need to address the retroviruses first or in conjunction with the parasites? So this is, of course, like, uh, um, I don't want to play God, you know, but what is clear to me, so some beautiful papers that show that uh, many, many parasites themselves are infected with Lyme disease. If you treat Lyme disease as a first treatment, the Lyme spirochetes inside the parasite survive your treatment because it is unlikely that your antimicrobial treatment directed at Lyme is also a powerful antiparasitic. And so let's say you do three years of IV, uh, Rocephin and Zithromax and, and all of that um, without addressing the parasites. The patient does great while they're on the therapy, but the moment you stop within three weeks, all the symptoms are back. Yeah, because the the air, the airplane carriers are still there. <laughs> the the the, the Lyme spark is launching their new kind of presence in the blood from inside the parasites and re uh, inoculate the system. And so, what I'm proposing to you is to work from large to small to start with the parasites the next bigger thing in size you know so parasites are multicellular and pretty much everything else that comes is unicellular so it goes from mold to uh, so it goes from parasites to yeast yeast are molds but with several cells attached to each other so we go from parasites to yeast like candida is a good idea then to mold the single cellular molds then to the protozoal organism, which is always the harder ones, you know, the Babesia and the Toxoplasmosis, which is often overlooked in people um, and, and other creatures of, you know, Giardia, Amoebas, uh, uh, Malaria and some, I had a few cases of that in my lifetime in America, working in America. And then when you've managed that, then you get to the bacteria, you know, that's, you got the Rocky Mountain spotted fever, you got the Bartonella, and you've got the Borrelia maybe as the main representatives. And so, and then we mastered those. That's when you focus heavily on the viruses. And then when you've done that, you focus on the retroviruses because they tend to be smaller bits of RNA and DNA. And then from, from that, you go to the prions. Yeah, so it's in that, in that order. And now it could be, you know, when you kill parasites, that the parasites are not only infected with Lyme, but they're also infected with viruses and retroviruses. And so we monitored that with ART. And then, you know, often on the first visit, we can only see the parasites. <laughs> we give you antiparasitic remedy. And on the next visit, oh my God, you know, there's Lyme, there's Bartonella. <laughs> and you're addressing that. And on the next visit, we see what we couldn't see before that now the mold shows up and we treat the mold and now the herpes viruses show up and we treat those and the Kokseki shows up. And so it's a predictable course. And so if you are a patient that doesn't have a practitioner, just start with the antiparasitics. I gave you some good guidance of the natural ones, the myrrh and the, I don't want to go there, yeah, but you can review the video and it gives you all the tricks that you can do without a prescription pad. Um, Fenbendazole is a new bug, yeah, it's a new antiparasitic, it's very powerful and still available for free on the internet. That's um, the powerful antiparasitic drug that, that you can, as a lay person, you can buy. Yeah, so, but work your way through that. Start with the parasites, go over to the yeast and the molds, and then go to the Lyme disease. Yeah, otherwise, you won't succeed. Okay, so let's see the next question. So, by the way, you know, um, Hildegard from Bingen said that a thousand years ago, for when you look at the house and there's a rat, for every rat that you see, there's a hundred that you don't see. She was the first one to wrote a book on infections. She could psychically see them without a microscope and uh, described a whole variety of species of infections that were killing people in her time. That was in the year 1050 or so. Um, and she had a sign um, somewhere in her drawer that was found later and published a thousand years later that said, not only that, but it said, for every bug that you find, 
in a human body, there's a hundred that you will never find that are also there. And so I think we are at the same at the same place today. You know, when we diagnose somebody with Lyme disease or Borrelia specifically, um, we can assume that there is a hundred other bugs that we don't see that, but that we need to anticipate and also treat. Okay, so, but, you know, why is that? Well, our immune system, you know, should be able to handle all of that for us. It should. It's designed that way, you know, and really what my work with ART is to find out why it's not doing that. And it's often the root canal, it's the, the cavitation in the jaw, it's a scar on the belly. Uh, you know, it could be a specific vitamin deficiency, a specific amino acid deficiency. It's usually something simple and you give it to the immune system and it runs with it and cleans up the field. The, again, the big elephant in the living room that we still do not know to really handle well is the 3G, 4G, 5G. Yeah? We, we have good methods. We have, I gave you a number of tools like the RayWave product to internally protect the body, the eShield skin cream, the protective clothing, the sleep sanctuary, but you know, 5G uses three wavelengths and one of them is a very low frequencies that just crash through everything. Any protective barrier that you could think of, it just smashes through that and gets all of us sick. You know, and so we need to do everything else. Okay, so let me see. I've had success with IV ceftrioxone, that's, uh, that's Rosefin, in terms of helping decrease anxiety but it only lasts for about five hours. Is it worth persisting with this treatment for a few weeks for a lasting effect? I think it's a very good question. The question is, you know, when an antibiotic works, typically the effect sets in after the earliest, after two days, two to three days. And if you get an immediate effect that then lasts for five hours, it is likely to not be the antibiotic effect that you're benefiting from, but ceftrioxone is also known to be a quite potent chelator of various toxins. It's also known as some adjacent antiviral effects, and those things are immediate. You know, so it is likely that there is a better treatment for this five-hour effect that you have. You know, I would probably postulate as the viruses. You know, and you may want to try uh, to use um, one of our herbal. Um, antivirals, you know, the main one is um, licorice, you know, that's for Epstein-Barr, and um, garlic is fantastic for HHV6. Um, so when we're trying to feel through the computer into your body, it's more likely that, and you always want to combine it with a good heavy metal detox program, which we have to review what those are, you know, but starting always with the foot bath, if you can get your hands on DMSA is great. Um, but the, the natural detox agents like cilantro, chlorella are very wonderful and very potent. Okay, Jane is asking, what to do if Artemisia provokes severe nausea uh, due to compromised liver detoxification pathways post hepatitis? Same issue with milk thistle. Anyway, to improve tolerance. Well, yes, obviously your liver is injured, you know, and if it's post hepatitis, it's again, very likely that you may have um, um, autoimmune process going on against some of the liver cells or the bile ducts. So this categorically, I recommend to do a gallbladder flush. We have a special version of that at the Sophia Health Institute at my clinic in Seattle that you can just simply purchase um, a sort of simplified version of the liver flush is in Andreas Moritz's book, The Amazing Liver and Gallbladder Flush, an excellent book to read anyway. Um, we just heard here at the Swiss Mountain Clinic, there is a uh, Eastern European researcher who comes here from time to time who has developed a spectacular revolutionary program just using for four days like certain teas like the at this hour you need to drink this tea and that much and then half an hour later you take this powder and then drink that tea and so with amazing results but short of that my favorite treatment because I had you know, Epstein-Barr related hepatitis um, a long time ago and suffered for a long time and what really helped me was a special probiotic mix 
it's known under the name Hetox, H-E-T-O-X. And I forgot the, the company that makes it, but you can get that from biocure.eu. It has that, it's a, it's a powder that you sprinkle in your food or your yogurt or whatever you're eating with pretty radical results when it comes to autoimmunity to that aspect of it. Yeah. But in terms of liver, we have many options. You've got homeopathy, you've got acupuncture, you got excellent herbs. You know, we have, I, um, I've developed together with key science, like a number of, of herbal products um, for the liver that are fantastic. Um, yeah, I'd like to, to leave that there. Um, maybe uh, from, a, from a medical medical point of view, uh, the new kid on the block is to modify your gut microbiome. Uh, with the drug that's more known for SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, you know, it's called Zyfaxin. I forgot the name of the generic name, but it doesn't really matter. So Zyfaxin is a fantastic tool to try out once. It's a 10-day uh, topically working antibiotic that com completely rearranges your bowel flora. It knocks C. diff out and some other pathogens. And it's kind of mild on the good flora. And it changes, and we've seen lots of livers improving with that. Okay, so let me see. Yeah, to the next page. Yeah, no, I'm going slow, and I'm not going to get through all the questions. But um, I think they're all good questions. Brooke is asking. I have suspected Lyme diagnosis, mold history, and I've had COVID four times. My question: Ivermectin makes me horribly sick after just three milligrams. Then the second three milligrams, four later, four hours later, confirmed it's a real herx. What can I do? I got COVID three more times since discovering this on March 20, the last time got over the virus, but I'm left with far worse brain and lung symptoms than I ever had before. Now, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to talk to you, but um, this, as a general thing, um, the, the proper treatment for the chronic persistence of this virus is to increase your zinc levels inside the cell. And that's done. Uh, it's a product called Core or Core S. Depending if you have Lyme, you use the Core S. Um, you take three capsules of that twice a day. And every time you do that, you take three capsules of quercetin with it. Quercetin is a so-called zinc ionophore. It carries the zinc for you in the cell. That is the most important. And then for general immunity, is a high vitamin D level. You want to be just above the upper range of normal. Um, that's a, the foundational therapy that has to be in there. And then there is the number of a variety of medical drugs that are published. The new kid on the block I can mention because I mentioned it in my parasite talk is my favorite antiparasitic. Is also my favorite antiviral. It's called the generic name is called Nitats oxonite. And um, that's 500 milligrams just two or three times a day. However, it's not available in Europe. You have to go through a pharmacy in the US or India or, or China. Nitats oxonite. Okay, how long do we pulse in the ultrasonic cleaner to make liposomal mixture? <laughs> okay, I like your English. Um, 15 minutes. Yeah, so uh, remember when we make, when we test people with ART, usually we come up with maybe one main herbal mix for Lyme, let's say the key vita. But then we also find that still Japanese knotweed is testing adjacent with that is something also needed and maybe some licorice for the viral component. And so we end up usually with four or five tinctures. My advice is for people to, you know, and usually in my prescription, I'll write how many parts. It, usually it's like, you know, let's say the key vita is a mix of many things. I say, okay, take three parts of that, and then one part of Japanese knotweed, one part of this and one part of that. Together, let's say it's six parts. And I said the seventh part has to be phospholipids, has to be the, the key science phospholipids. These are the finest, the smallest molecule size. And so you put that together in a glass jar and you shake it up. That's number one. But if you want to put this on fire or want to put it on steroids, so to say, then you put that, that glass into an ultrasonic cleaner. These are things that have a water bath in it. And you stick the glass in there and, and vibrates it at a very high speed. 
for 15 minutes. You, most of them switch off after like five minutes, so you have to push the button two more times. And that creates a wonderful, potent remedy. Yeah? But you don't want to start that way. You want to start first with just the herbal mix with alcoholic tinctures. Some of them may be glycerin-based. You start with that. And then when the patient has reached a decent amount of that that they can tolerate, but they don't get their migraine or don't reproduce their symptoms, then you add the phospholipids in. That is a huge increase in strength. It quadruples it roughly, the strength of what you're experiencing. And then when that has reached tolerance level, you, you're on a full dose with that and the patient doesn't experience either further improvements nor relapses, that's when you add in the uh, jewelry cleaner, the bath. You know, the, the interesting thing is the jewelry cleaner costs about 60, well, the bigger ones cost like about 60 bucks. When you get the same instrument from a medical supply, it's about 6,000 bucks. <laughs> Yes, there's a few more buttons on it and a few, you know, different housing and stuff, but the essential working part of it is the same. And so that's why we say jewelry cleaner. Okay, so let me see what the next question is here. Oh, yeah. Typically, how long are the Lyme disease co-infection protocols be initiated for? Well, um, so with what I just said, so you, you make your mix, you put it back in a dropper bottle. And with most people that are chronically severely ill, I start with one drop twice a day. Watching out for the patient to have adverse reactions. So you do two drops twice a day, and then you go quickly up to like a pipette or two twice a day. Ideally, twice a day dosing has been shown to be ideal. You want to get a big whack a few times rather than a small whack over the day. And then... Um, the, the full working dose, like with the Kiwi, that we know that is uh, two teaspoons twice a day. When you reach that level and you don't have any aggravation of symptoms or so, you're pretty much on the home run. You know, then you can add the other tinctures and you can make them liposomal. And then you know, as you take it then for a few weeks, it penetrates deeper and deeper and deeper into tissues and you reach levels that you haven't reached before with new side effects and you pull back a little bit and you play around the edge of what you tolerate until you tolerate a good amount. Like when we have a, a mix of um, many things together, it's still, the, the full dose would still be like something like two or three teaspoons twice a day of the symbiotic or synergistic mixes that you take. Okay, so let's see. Well, you mentioned a colleague who's developing homeopathic remedies, but I missed his name. <laughs> <laughs> Does he have purchased products? So first of all, I've got about 500 friends who develop homeopathic remedies. So I really don't know what this refers to. Uh, here's a good one. Can chlorine dioxide be used for Lyme and the other organisms treatment? Yes. MMS um, is now renamed it's CDS chlorine dioxide solution. Um, you want to follow the Andreas Kalka protocols. Kalka is K-A-L. CKER. Um, there is now several peer-reviewed studies that are showing it very, very effective for all of the current issues that we have in the world that I'm not allowed to mention, but also has been shown to be very effective for most form of chronic uh, borrelia, at least the part that lives in the blood. There's always a good section that lives in the blood before it goes in the brain. You may not be able with the CDS to reach deep inside the brain. That's been my experience that you still need the liposomal herbs to, to do that last bit of the work, but you can, with CDF, hugely clean up the blood and it's very, very potent antiviral for the current virus because it lives in the inner lining of the blood vessels, which you can perfectly reach with that. Is there a good candidate for the foot bath for people who can't have electric impact due to EMF sensitivity. Yeah, so first of all, you know, increase EMF sensitivity. It'd be good to do like the 23andMe, some genetic testing to see the COMT and some of the other genes that make us more vulnerable to these things and see if there's not other ways of fortifying your system. Um, but on the mother end, you know, if you can tolerate the foot bath, the original idea was from Japan is the uh, foot pads with uh, fermented bamboo vinegar. You know, that gets, bamboo gets fermented for like seven years or so, 
and creates this slouches that gets put in this pad that you tape on the bottom of the feet. And then over overnight or over a day, it turns dark brown and ugly. And it really has been shown to then contain mercury and lead, nickel and other metals. It's not per application, not as effective as a single foot bath, but it's for sure the next best. But is there a specific frequency or waveform that the ionic foot bath should run at? The answer is yes. Klingard spent 30 years of his life finding out what that frequency is and recommended for key science to put it in there. And I'm certainly not inclined to give it to you. <laughs> you can get it in the form of the buying the foot bath, but I will not give that secret away. That cost me 30 years of sweat <laughs> and, and more and money. Okay. Does eating sugar make the spirochetes come out? As a double-edged sword, uh, sugar, uh, the cells open the channels for amino acids and sugars when sugar floats by. It's actually the job of, so sugar increases insulin and insulin actually opens the doors to the cell. And that's exactly what the spirochetes need to infect the new cell. Also viruses need that. So sugar is usually the driver of infections spreading. However, sugars also tease the bugs to come out of biofilm and eat sugar because they're all ad addicted like children. You know, bugs are like children. You can pretty much translate everything that children love to the bugs. And so, um, yeah, it's a double-edged sword. So we use sugar. Um, a really good friend of mine has turned me on to the idea of turpentine. Turpentine treatment for both parasites and chronic infections is three teaspoons of sugar as bait and one teaspoon of turpentine, you know, biologically clean, organic, yeah. Turpentine is a squeezed pine needle juice. And so that given once a day is a fantastic treatment for a whole host of other things. I gave you that recipe in my parasite talk. Okay, um, would Dr. Klinger please cover addressing mold in Lyme patients? Yeah, so, I mean, the answer is complicated and, and pretty simple. So first of all, um, the important mold is the one that grows in your house that you're inhaling every day, that you're exposed to every day. A square inch of mold produces about 2000 biotoxins per day. One of them is enough if you inhale it and it, it unleashes its destructive force in your system, it, it's a real issue. So the important thing with mold is don't live in a mold, moldy home. The unfortunate thing is that in the US, every home is a moldy home and so, we have to live with compromises. You know, the compromise that I taught you is to get a propolis vaporizer in the most important rooms in the house. You get that, again, there's a frequency involved with this. It's only in the instrument that you can buy from Key Science. The other ones don't have that. You know, there's similar looking instruments um, that come from the Italian company that makes it, but it's the, the propolis vaporizer creates a fine mist of propolis in the air that attaches to the mycotoxins and also to living mold and somebody drops into the floor. You can clean up a room within two hours with that. And so that's number one, your, your home should be reasonably mold free as much as that's possible. But beyond that, there's that old conflict, you know, that we had in our think tank where Richie Shoemaker was there and Joe Boroscano was there and was that unresolved issue hanging in the air uh, everybody came there with their opinions. Everybody ended with the same opinions. One group thinking the mold is first, and then Lyme is the opportunistic bug that comes in because you have mold. <laughs> and the other group was, no, the mold is the Lyme is there first. It suppresses the immune system, and because that, the, the mold takes root in you and, and uh, grows in you and does its thing in you. And so I test with ART everybody for both, and we find out that um, Lyme itself and the co-infections are far more common and far more common the cause of illness than mold itself. However, living mold in us, there's a difference between inhaling mycotoxins that they work like a toxin, they don't replicate, but they, they do the thing in you, they destroy something in you, maybe your kidneys, your liver, your eyes. And, but it's proportional to the number that you inhale is the effect. The other thing is if you have mold that grows in you 
and it produces mycotoxins every day, there's a whole other animal and that mold needs to be gotten rid of. We do that with the rhizoles. Yeah, rhizole gamma is my favorite. It's very, very well tolerated. It's 10 drops three times a day in a glass of water. We give you instructions at the parasite talk how to, um, how to use that. And that should be part of everybody's treatment. It's only there for <coughs> three to six weeks. You get rid of aspergillus of all the worst kinds of mold. There is a German study. It was far more uh, uh, effective than uh, Zfend, uh, and, and you know, certainly more effective uh, than than the most common. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to avoid names here, so do not get in, in, in conflict with the industry that's also watching. So it's more effective than the most common mold remedies that we prescribe as physicians. And it's extremely well tolerated. And the, the fringe effect is, you know, when you use work with the rhizoles, the ozonated plant oils, you're also treating many bacteria and many viruses and many other things. So it's, it has a much more broad effect. And yet it's still very specific, specific for uh, aspergillus, penicillin, for stachybotrys, and, and all of that. Okay. So, with a lipid form, will a lipid form of an herbal go into biofilm? Yes, that's published that phospholipids and liposomal herbs tend to easily be taken up into biofilm and exert their biological effect there. Yeah, that's why we ultimately, especially with autoimmune disease, especially those of you who listen who've got Addison's disease, you need to make the herbs that you take for getting rid of the Borrelia, especially the Kiwita and the Japanese knotweed. You need to make those liposomal and you need to get the ultrasound cleaner and put the effort in in doing it that way and then starting with one drop twice a day and then creeping it up as you tolerate it to the full treatment dose um and you look at the time five minutes five minutes yeah okay um hello dr Klinger. is it possible to remove lime spirochetes from the brain and body and how to do this or is it chronic well um <laughs> That's of course an excellent, excellent question. So we have with the only tool, the only tool in the world that currently that is able to show whether you still have Lyme spirochetes in the brain or Babesia or Bartonella is my ART. And so first of all, I recommend to all of you to take the now online course, ART1 and ART2, where you learn this really incredible procedure where you can look into the brain within seconds of starting analyzing the patient without having to be invasive. Yeah? And so we found that the, the way I got to the selection of certain herbs is not just through reading the literature and finding out what's published, but then trying it out and seeing what is needed to get the stuff into the brain. And there's a thing that I'm teaching in my courses called drug uptake impairment and the most common reason why herbs or, or other compounds, antibiotics, don't end up in sufficient concentration in the deeper parts of the brain is, for example, a chronic sinusitis is a root-filled tooth. It's a cavitation in the jawbone. It's a chronic tonsil um, infection. It's a scar on the abdomen. It can be many things, but we're teaching a very careful, meticulous approach of finding out what is creating the drug uptake. Uh, problem. And so with that, we've succeeded in getting enough concentration of the liposomal herbs into the deep limbic system of the patient to get rid of the anxiety and the uh, compulsive behavior, and the, especially the, the lack of sleep and, and all of those things. The biggest, um, and I say it right here, maybe at the end of my, my lecture, the most common reason why your medication, it doesn't matter if it's medical school antibiotics or if it's Klinghardt's Lyme cocktails, the main reason why it is not ending up in high enough concentration in the brain is the Wi-Fi environment and the use of the cell phone. You know, most of you are self-destructing with the time spent on the phone uh, every day and some of you some of you very dear to me, you know, use the cell phone all day long 
or all night long after work and uh, impairing the uptake of uh, important nutrients and antimicrobials into the brain um, and also disabling your white blood cells. You know, the, at the clinic here, the Swiss Mountain Clinic, where I'm, I'm just sort of as a resident, um, the, um, they did a beautiful work with dark field microscopy that basically shows um, we have this beautiful blood from a patient <laughs> and you put the cell phone in on position close to the microscopy slide and immediately white blood cells become paralyzed and they don't move for another day you know, after just a few seconds of exposure. It's really terrible. It's the elephant in the living room that nobody talks about or not enough people talk about. And even the people that talk about it understand that they're still on the phone all day long. So it's it's a difficult one. Yeah, it's a consensus reality that says it's okay. And there's a biological truth, it's not okay. Okay, so I've come close to the last question. Can I use both Cruella and infrared sauna treatment in the same day for aluminum detox and so on? Yes, absolutely. So here's a bit of a number. So it's suspected, you know, the, the guts, the entire gut has a surface of about two tennis courts. The skin has only a surface of two square meters. And so uh, 20,000 square meters, two square meters. And so when we're in the sauna and we're starting to sweat, the same sweating is going on in the gut. And it is suspected that the gut sweats out hundreds of times more toxins in the sauna uh, then your skin sweats out. However, all of those toxins that get excreted through the gut wall into the small intestine largely, into the lumen of the gut, and in the next half hour or hour, they all get reabsorbed. Unless, unless you prepare the gut and have the entire gut lined with chlorella or zeolite or both. They can be both taken at the same time. And so what we recommend is, <coughs> first of all, It'd be great if you could do a little bit of sauna every day, but if you only go once a week, you should at least in the 24 hours before going to the sauna, take a good whack of chlorella, let's say 10, 15 tablets every hour <coughs> the day before and the day off the sauna, and then go in the sauna. And then the next day, your poop should be green for the next couple of days and carry out all those sweated out particles, probably in the number thousands of times more than what you sweat it out through the skin. And then, you know, by the way, after a sauna, you should always have a dry towel and immediately rub off the sweat before it goes back in. And that's why after each sauna, you should have a cold shower first because that closes the pores in the skin and prohibits the toxins that you just sweat it out to come back in. In America, I found out, you know, the typical way to do a sauna is to be hours in the sauna and there's no cold water around anywhere. And so that's not right. So I know um, my hour is over. And so I'm probably going to make an authoritative decision <laughs> to um, maybe next week to just go through all the questions and end and, and the questions. Because I do want you to know that we are successful with treating chronic Lyme disease at any stage without the use of antibiotics, by simply understanding some of these principles and putting them into action. And, and those of my patients who actually follow this without bringing in too many other things from other um, religions <laughs> within alternative medicine, um, they tend to get well over time. And uh, so with that, I'm saying good night to you guys. Thank mm -hmm. you.